some simple facts about me, right? So I got my PhD from U Waterloo back in 2012. Uh, major in cryptography. Like my research was focused on lightweight cryptography, basically make it feasible for IoT constrained devices. So some of my research has been standardized by NIST. Uh, you, you know, after just like a four and a half year doing most like academic research type of stuff, I think like the industry is interesting. So I, you know, joined Google, stayed there four and a half year, leading lots of projects. Uh, some of you, uh, maybe you heard about like HTTP2, uh, certificate transparency, like, uh, you know, SSL, everywhere crime and uh, breach attacks yeah also i'm a funding engineer for the load balancer product like google cloud has right now and then i moved to uber stay there for you know a little bit more than one year leading a team to do lots of security privacy uh, regulation stuff so if you happen to be a uber user don't worry about it all your data is actually pro protected by me and my team and my system behind yeah don't worry um and then after that i found the io tax right so that's where are we right now uh back in 2017. So this presentation is about make your home not spying on you. Uh, I think it's a very interesting like a use case uh, we are building and also we see like a very strong synergy between IPFS and Filecoin. Okay, so let me jump right into this one. Uh, so basically we are surrounded by billions of inter, uh, intelligent and internet connected devices. So which are observing and recording us all the time and all this sensitive information, you know, from our homes about ourselves is actually getting collected and used, you know, by either Google, Amazon, like a corporate intermediaries or like a hackers, right? They can do data breach. So the dream for a smart, safe and private future is strengthened uh, basically by this intrusive surveillance with a lot of, you know, bad news, negativities about this uh, camera, some lots of smart home devices, right? So that's a problem and we should fix it. So that's why um, I, I founded IOTAX back in 2017 with two other co-founders. Um, so we're in Menlo Park. So you guys, you know, feel free to come by uh, once California reopens. And we have 30-ish, you know, top people from, from, you know, Google, Uber, Facebook, and also some top universities. So the goal for IOTAX is basically to build like an open platform for the internet of trusted things. Uh, we want, you know, power those smart and connected devices uh, in a very trusted way, trusted way and enable like the interaction of these physical things uh, and digital things all together, allow them to change information, you know, value and so on. So if you want to take a look, so here is our GitHub, some of the research papers we do have, and here's the, uh, here's the trader. So back to the security camera business, right? So there are basically like a two types of concerns we are saying right now. So the first one is like a security concerns. It's mostly because the all the like your credentials, you know, login password, whatever is located in a very centralized system, which might be buggy, which might be vulnerable. Uh, and also user's input of this password could be very weak. That leads to database breach, you know, liquid, liquid your password, liquid your video data, so on and so forth. So that's a security concern we can characterize. Another one is like a privacy concerns. So that comes with the fact that all your video data is actually hosted by you know, Google, Amazon, and even some of the device manufacturers. So they have the chance you know, to really look into your data to see what is going on, why it's so interesting, maybe fit this to the machine learning algorithm you know, to try to do some magic stuff. So definitely like not something you would be super interested in, right? So that, that, that's also like a privacy concern. Um, Right, to fix this one, I, I, I think like we have the right technology already. So that's why we um, partnership with a, a camera manufacturer uh, actually in Asia. Um, and uh, we uh, together, like we, we have made this view can, basically we design, redesign the entire architecture and we you know, design the underlying crypto protocols. So this, this device has been like a debuted in CES earlier this year and also win this innovation work. The whole idea is basically like a you as an owner should own your home data, home video data, right? Okay, so I do have like a short, very short introduction video about you can from the per, uh, product perspective. So let me... The camera that lets you own your privacy. The UCAM app supports multiple UCAMs, which are all accessible on the home dashboard. Each UCAM comes with its own set of controls so you can customize your experience. With two-way audio, 1080p livestream video, and pan, tilt, and zoom controls, you'll never miss a thing. 
You can also set up motion detection alerts and record video on demand even while you're on the go. Your motion detection clips and video recordings across all of your cameras are stored privately in your own personal data vault. You can search for old videos based on date and time and also download and share these videos seamlessly with other users. With UCAM, you are in full control of your data. You can choose to delete it, view it, or share it at any time. The UCAM app not only has great functionality, but it also has great customizability. Each UCAM has granular settings that can be tailored to your lifestyle. For example, you can set motion detection alerts to be active only at specific hours. You can also set UCAM to record continuous footage to a local SD card. In your settings, you can also secure yeah, I think that's that's pretty much about the fun part. Pause back. Um, so yeah, as you can see, as a product is a, a state of the art home camera. Uh, it comes with all the uh, fancy features it should have. Um, but you know, behind this camera, uh, there are actually four very innovative technologies we have put into. So the first one is like a user centric team management. Uh, so the main idea here is like have user to control lots of things. Uh, let me um, dive down. I have a slide for that. And also uh, because of this user centric key, key management control, we can enable end to end encryption between the camera and the user. And of course, we want to create like a digital twin uh, that is verifiable. So that's why we also bury with, you know, DID technology. And the most importantly is like this storage, you know, has to be user owned, right? Not anyone else. So that's why I think I reserve this most important important part for the last. Uh, definitely, like we see a very strong uh, synergy between IPFS and uh, Biocoin here. So this is like a very high level architecture, how things look like behind the scene, right? So you have multiple parts. Basically, like a user has an app. The app basically uh, serves as a wallet. It comes with like a private key user generates uh, and this private key is used, used to derive other keys that pair with the camera. Then all the camera data is actually gets encrypted the moment it gets captured, right? So any of the user who has this, you know, giant private key can access the data. The same as any of you has a private key can access your Bitcoin. Once it's, you know, you lost your private key and then everything's gone. So that's, that's fair enough. And we have done some, you know, device management part on the, on the public blockchain. And we now, we use like a third party vendor that provides P2P services, basically for the camera and the app talking with each other, you know, regardless like where that sets, maybe a camera within your home network, you know, this mobile app is in the 4G, 5G network. So this part is still like a, from a third party, we are going to kill it, you know, in a more, by using like a more decentralized one. Then all the encrypted, you know, videos are actually gets uploaded to the, remote storage places. For one, option one we have for the user is like cloud storage, like a S3, uh, which is very familiar by lots of customers. So they are just normal people, right? So they don't understand too much about this uh, technology. So they can use cloud if they want. But most importantly is option two. We do want to have this option here for very advanced users or maybe very privacy aware users, right? That put in their data onto IPFS and Filecoin. So that's that, that's why we're having this 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 conversation with the part of the lab folks. Um, yeah, so let, let me go through like this four pillars just one by one. Uh, I'm talking about the storage part um, at last. So the user centric key management basically means two things, right? So the first one is we remove the centralized authentication server from the entire picture. Uh, so there's no such a place user you know password or maybe a password hash gets stored with that username. So user have to you know click and send something to that service to get a token back. So we remove that part completely by using like a modern public key cryptography uh, through uh, like a challenge response type of protocol. So that's that's one. And then second one is like I kind of mentioned. So this encrypted key is actually generated in the app and which has been encrypted using master key and sent to the camera in a P2P fashion, where this master key is any, you know, derived from user's private key. So like everything is so protected that any of the camera and the you know, app owner knows this, this key um, to, to decrypt the video content. So that's, that's the first thing, like a user-centric key management. 
because we have such a you know very you know kind of complete complicated but decent design for this key exchange protocol we can enable like end-to-end -end encryption very easily so not all the encryption are created the same you know like usually uh, you have this client to server encryption meaning like someone sitting in the middle issue the key to the client issue the key to the server then they can talk right but the vulnerability here is this guy sits in the middle who can you know decrypt all the communications between these two sets uh, and know what you're talking about but end-to-end -end encryption is definitely like a getting rid of this man in the middle uh, by having these two just talking, you know, interactively uh, and also securely. So definitely we have this end-to-end -end encryption like a back into lots of uh, parts for, for you can. So that's a, that, that's a second one. So the third one is DID. Um, so I'm not sure like how familiar you guys are, uh, you know, with DID. Uh, just uh, so that's, that's why I, I prepare basically like two slides to explain what is DID and how we use it. So if you look at like the trust model for the web, right? So there are basically like two models. One is like a, a PKI. Basically you have like a tri <coughs> structure where the C is it's on the root. So everybody trusts the C, right? Then everybody can visit like a new website they've never done before because the cat comes with like a certificate that's signed by a CA that you trust. So this is a like a very centralized way. So everybody trusts the CA. Another way to build trust is called a web of trust. Uh, I think before we have some technology called a PGP, but today we can use DID to realize a very similar uh, like a type of idea. Basically A trust B, B trust C, then A trust C. So that's a very simple idea behind web of trust. So DID is such a technology, uh, it, it's very simple. Um, so it's just a key value store, right? So the key is like a DID and the value is DID doc. So how does the DID look like? Uh, so if we look at this, this string, which is DID IO123456, it comes in with two, th uh, three parts. One is schema, DID, of course it's DID. And one is method, this is basically IO. Uh, different blockchains have different kind of prefix. So we reserve IO for IO tax, uh, but there are other blockchains who can also do DID. And the last part is just a method specific identifier. Could be, you know, hash of a public key, could be, you know, just like a UID number, uh, yeah, UUID number as well. So how this like the DID can be, you know, linked to our DID doc, which is, you know, like this, look like this, just full content of meta information. So it's going through a process called the resolution. So the resolution is more, much more like a DNS type of idea. It goes through two, two layers. So the first layer is you have the string, you go to a service called a universal resolver, it points you to the right blockchain, right? So is this like IO, okay, go to IOTEX blockchain. If this is SOV, okay, go to Sovereign blockchain, right? So that's layer one. So layer two is once you land it on that specific blockchain, so you're going to do uh, like, a, you know, going to get the DID doc through this identifier. So the blockchain will look at this one, two, three, four, five, six, nine, ten, 10, uh, and get you back like the right document. Yeah. So it's as simple as it is, right? So by having this, uh, there are four nice properties. Of course, it's decentralized because you know everybody can launch a DID, everybody can do it, and also it's verifiable. I, I will show you the next slide, and non-resignable because you know it's tied to your private key. Uh, it's same as you know you gave the private key of Bitcoin to another guy. Best things could happen, right? Uh, resolvable, like I just described. So once you have this DID doc you know you look into the doc you find like the information that might make sense to you for example so what's the manufacturer did right who this belongs to what's the metadata of this product and most importantly they come up with some idea called a verifiable credential especially like a credential like a claim uh, for example i claim i'm a phd from your waterloo right then this credential gets signed by your waterloo right by the exact like the party who can issue this type of proof. Then you carry this all the time with you, you mean like the device, and you can prove to people, okay, I, this device was manufactured, you know, by this manufacturer, and this device has the insurance um, basically from this insurance provider. So this all type of thing uh, goes to the DID doc. So this is like a main body for digital twin uh, we, we are having here. So the purpose of, of doing DID and digital twin is basically we want to make sure all the attributes, all the information about UCAN is verifiable in a cryptography way, right? 
Uh, so that's why, you know, so that's why we have a DAO deployed on the blockchain that manages all the, you know, DID, registration, deregistration, lots of things. And we have UCAN to basically provision this DID when the first time gets set up. Then we, uh, then the UCAN can just request VCs, like a verifiable credentials from different parties, one from manufacturer, one from, you know, insurance provider, and another one from probably like a storage provider as well, right? Um, that way, I, I think we want to make you can every behavior of you can very testable and verifiable, thus to fight against some, you know, hacks, some security issues over there. So that's a third technology we do have in this small camera. And lastly, I think that will come to like very interesting part about the storage, right? Everybody has a desire to store the data somewhere. Um, so that's why like a storage have a very strong requirement. So, uh, so, so like the format I, I want to have here is like a requirement and asks for the IPF community, right? And I do have two scenarios. Let me do them one by one. So the first scenario is basically user will do this. Uh, so the camera will have a motion detector. It sees something's moving. It will record, I don't know, 20 seconds. And then, you know, upload this encrypted video clip back to the cloud or IPFS uh, in a secure way. Uh, and this information sitting on the cloud or IPFS can only access at the owner. And user, of course, can grant access to their trust ones, you know, family members, friends, you know, uh, people who they trust. And also this like a file retention should be, you know, uh, customizable by user's preference. For example, like we have seven days, 14 days, and 30 days like a retention for user to choose. For now, the first implementation we use S3, so it definitely like uh, looks like this. But we are doing like we are actually talking with like uh, Derich, uh, trying to see how can we you know also have a very similar concept, but put on the IPFS. So I think that I, I do have three questions, right? Um, I I will happy to you know do more interaction after you know and by end of this presentation. So the first one is like a recommended setup. So I, I see like a two or maybe even three type of setup we could have. So one is like a user have a NAS, like a network storing services sitting at home, which runs IPFS software. So by having this, the user can actually have the video record goes to their local NAS, but still he will be able to access a video out of, out of her, uh, maybe him, his like a home network, right? Because, you know, IPFS is such a good, you know, kind of CD <laughs> type of technology. So that's, that's the first one. Or should we set up like our own S3 and also running some IPFS, you know, in front of this S3 and to serve for the user? Or should we just use a pinning service like a Pinata? I think like uh, Kyle and me, we, we talk about this uh, when we when we were doing like a Berkeley meetup, uh, like a, probably two months ago. So that's one, right? So 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 that's that's one thing I I, I need to ask the IPFS community. The second one is authentication possible to get access to files. I have a, like an email thread with Juan before, and here is a good point. Like basically even encrypted, this video data is kind of sensitive and private. So can we build like a permissioned overlay on top of like a very open P2P uh, IPFS network, right? So for example, I only trust this few IPFS nodes who can, you know, relay my uh, video content files so I can access everywhere. Um, yeah, can, can we do that? I, I, I don't know. The third one is like uh, the file retention because you know this video data is huge. I can show you the next slide, which we do have an estimation. Um, it's huge. We don't want to like, keep the data there forever, right? So we want to purge your data, maybe seven days, 30 days, I don't know. But is there a way like we can if it's a cache, we can, you know, set this TTL of the cache to be, you know, seven days or 14 days, right? Do we have a very similar concept in the IPFS network? Um, yeah, that's that's a third ask. So uh, moving on to this, uh, the second scenario, I, I, I want to, you know, <clears throat> definitely like a new feature we want built is this shareable storage. So the idea is very much like a YouTube or maybe TikTok, but, you know, in, in the smart home uh, scenario. Basically, user decide to share some very funny video or whatever video publicly. So he will just decrypt everything and put it on IPFS. Then share the CID to like a, you know board or something like with hashtags, and other people can retrieve the CID to see the videos you know they are interested in. And of course, I see IPFS as a very 
interesting like an upload system that means like a code videos will eventually disappear no one cares but the hot ones will stay which is good um, but when we you know really look into this idea i, I found like a two very challenging things um, I, I i don't have a you know a solution for so the first one is is this fast enough right so think about it if you want to use youtube or maybe TikTok, you definitely you want to open up the app then you want to see the like the moving or maybe like a video clips right away um, but like my experience as an ipfs user is it's very slow for the first time they load load up the content uh, yeah so is there any way like we can do prefetch is there any way like we can improve like a user experience i think that's that's a very also interesting uh, topic we should talk about and the second thing is um, i know ipfs is very open so there's no censorship at all but in this scenario we do need some type of censorship or maybe filtering, maybe parent control, right? No, whatever you call it. Uh, because you say this is like a very family style, like an app, you will be probably using with your kids, your you know, wife, your husband, the one you care about. And you don't want some, you know, some random content to just show up in your app, which might be uh, not so uh, user friendly. Is there a way like we can do that? Uh, not, 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 not too sure. So, uh, yeah. So that's another ask to the IPFS community. Yeah. Uh, you know, despite this, given very like a technical challenges, uh, we will do see like a strong requirement for the storage as you can grow. So we have this projection, uh, which is basically like a linear. Uh, a, a, as we dis, uh, invested, so e each of the UK users will consume roughly one gigabyte of storage for like a seven days rolling store of video. So let's say we have like a one user, he will just use one gigabyte of storage. So if we have one sound user, that's one TB, terabyte of like a storage, right? One million user, which is not something too hard because we talk with this camera partner, like they sold, you know, one million US uh, cameras in the US market in the past 12 months. That will consume like one terabyte of storage size. So, uh, so that's why I, I do say like, 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 like the value, you know, of this IPFS and Filecoin, um, especially if you can, you know, provide decentralization at the same time, uh, be, cost be cost effective and also performant. So that's, that's like a huge demand. <clears throat> you can 2.0, definitely like a we, you can one is, you know, about to get out the door probably in two, three weeks. Uh, definitely we want to send the you can to each of you guys uh, to you know, have a try and give us some feedback, but you can 2.0 is also on the way. We want to do something very similar, but you know, different form factors, outdoor, doorbell, maybe indoor for for for, for offices. Uh, and also, we want to blend in some new technologies we have, like a secure element. It's like secure hard wallet, hardware wallet, right? Basically, you store the private key uh, in the in the security element. And decentralized networking infra is another thing we are looking into. We want to remove this P2P layer, which is kind of centralized, although it's called P2P, but it's centralized. And third one is confidential computing. We want to enable AI and compute over encrypted data. That's so many things uh, we want to accomplish in, in UCAN 2.0. Yeah, so the long-term vision, right? So we, we, we did say like IPFS and Filecoin as the storage layer for IoTT, Internet of Trust Things. Uh, which is in the center of the, you know, the tech stack we, 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 we're saying here. Um, uh, let, let me like uh, briefly describe this tech stack. Uh, so we do see like uh, the blockchain as a, uh, you know, root of trust sitting down on the, on, on the bottom, very bottom layer, uh, which is something we already have, you know, built and launched in the past two years. And the middleware have this, like uh, three very critical parts and decentralized storage will be one of them. And we did say like uh, Filecoin and IPFS will be like, you know, be the core player for this decentralized storage in the next, I don't know, one to three years. And the other two components we are working on, one is like a decentralized identity and one is confidential computing. And then on the third layer, we can talk about, you know, tools, APIs, views. It's basically like a presentation layer for the, for the button infra. And then we can build like a, you know, trusted data, trust devices on the very top. So while we are, you know, uh, layering up our technologies. So we want to use UCAN as a first vertical to tap into and to make everything work. Then we can do like a horizontal, like a uh, scaling. Yeah, so that's that's pretty much about my presentation. So uh, so here's my, all my information, no privacy at all, right? So if you want to get in touch with me, uh, just, you know, pin me 
uh, in any way you like. Okay, so I'm done and I'm open to any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much for this great presentation. Super awesome. We did have a question from Ricardo. I'm going to read it to you. He said, mm -hmm. so a lot of deep learning applications use facial recognition. How do you see using this tech as part of your overall architecture? How do you guarantee the privacy and security? Yeah, <clears throat> that's a very good question. We have think a lot about this one. So that's why uh, confidential computing could be something really um, critical to us because you know if everything is encrypted, everything is owned by the user, then there is no way to make the data computable. No matter you do AI, you do big data, there is no way, right? So that's why that's why we want to do confidential computing as a very critical component here as well, and it will be able to read the encrypted data from this decentralized storage layer and to compute some insights. Um, in a, in, a, in, a, in a secure fashion and privacy preserving fashion. So the idea is to use like some enclaves, basically Intel has, ARM has this technology. So it's like a very small safe box sitting on top of, on top of your like hardware chip. Uh, if you trust hardware, if you trust Intel, yeah, definitely something like you can, you can do. But uh, I, I know this doesn't sound like, uh, you know, perfect compared to, you know, zero knowledge proof, but there are some trade-offs. If you want to do zero knowledge proof, or if you want to do multi-party computation, then that's not too practical for lots of applications we have today, right? It's heavy, it's slow, it's limited. Um, so this <clears throat> like a TEE type of style of confidential computing, basically you have to trust like the chief manufacturer in a way, right? But still, if you trust him, if you trust Intel, for example, you can delegate this task to their chips so they can compute more powerful and flexible tasks. That's it. Awesome. Another question from Kosten. Um, is our DIDs mature for gaining private data, um, especially in the data loss recovery scenario? Do you have a special flavor of DIDs for IOTEX? Uh, yeah, but, but, but like, like I said, DID is actually tied to the private key. Uh, the device or the owner should have, right? So if you lost your private key, definitely you lost your identity. Um, but that doesn't matter, you can create another DID. It's basically like cost-free. So um, yeah, you can create as many DID as you wish. Yeah, I, I don't think there is a way, you know, similar as find your password uh, type of feature can be built into DID as of now. Awesome. I, it might be useful to go back to the, um, the questions that, that you had for the IPFIS community as well for people to, to think about them more. But That's I think Juan had a hand. This is awesome. Thank you so much for, for uh, sharing this presentation. And, and it's um, really great to see the, see the use case. I uh, look at um, the, you know, the very careful uh, thoughtfulness you put into making a product that you know, is, is a consumer-oriented thing that a lot of people are going to um, going to use and uh, you know fills a, a need that a lot of people have in kind of the mainstream mainstream world um, and, and really rooted in, in in privacy being the key use case right like this is like the uh, an amazing use case because um, if Web three can get this right then like that that solves like one of the biggest biggest hurdles um, you know private video um, especially kind of security camera footage or or home video and so on is is about the most private thing that you can get right and so. Um, that kind of stuff, uh, nailing it, it and doing it well in Web3 and, and, and having that be a success story um, can really prove out tons of use cases. Um, it's also really large files. And so being able to do this well requires um, a large amount of data storage, requires um, really fast uh, throughput uh, in connections and so on. So it's, it's a fantastic use case. Uh, really like, uh, thank you for, for, for putting this projected storage need. Uh, I think this, this is really helpful for, um, for, for bidding services because they can they can look at this and, and think about growing helping you grow with this right so where um, you know thinking about going from thousands of users to millions of users uh, that's, that's totally doable for uh, probably you know single single pinning services are, are um, probably in the lower terabyte range at the moment most uh, probably most but but uh, starting to get larger um, also the the, the Falcon network is now you know the testnet on its own is is pushing like around five petabytes without um, uh, without incentives. Once we have incentives, we'll we'll, we'll see how things things change. That might that might grow 
um, to be a lot larger. So this is, I think, like a really good opportunity right now for um, uh, pinning services to to uh, help you get started and especially provide kind of like fast access and fast retrieval, um, plus any kind of um, kind of developer tooling and developer um, experience kind of kind of support. Um, and then uh, as as the needs scale, once you start hitting into the to the high petabytes or exabytes, like that, that's when uh, things like Cloudflare become like uh, uh, really useful, and you start like recruiting a lot of the storage in the network. Um, so I think uh, 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 one question around this is, uh, do you think that like it, you know, I think a lot of the, these camera products tend to limit the amount of storage because um, because it's so expensive to store and serve, and so these things will automatically delete your video every every seven days. Um, I, I don't know the details on on, on how the purchasing um, works there in terms of you know what are the price points at which people start storing a lot more. Uh, but I imagine that if we can drop the price of storage significantly here, um, people would be storing a lot more of this uh, of this data. It's kind of like that that uh, I think it was like coal phenomenon or tin phenomenon, where once the price drops significantly, a lot of people started buying a lot more of it. Yeah, I do agree. Um, so for now, right? So we have a pretty user friendly like a pricing plan here. Uh, so we can do like a seven day, like a rolling store of the data. It's just $2 per month for lots of people. But if you know, Filecoin, once it's launched, can bring down this, you know, to $1 a month, maybe even half a dollar a month. I think that, that's amazing, you know. Lots of people will just be a no brainer for lots of people. <laughs> I do agree, yes. Yeah, so, and, and um, so for your questions, uh, can, can you go? Yeah, so for this one, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I think in terms of the recommended setup, uh, I think that this, this can work really, really well. You could, you could go a few of these different routes. Um, I would recommend starting to work with a pinning service because they, they understand IPFS really well. They've been kind of storing it, um, uh, kind of in, in production for, for a while. Um, and then see, see kind of how that goes. And, and you know, there's, there's a bunch of folks here, here today. Um, there were a number of presentations earlier. Um, encourage you to talk to a number of them and kind of evaluate the, the, the offerings and, and, and get a sense of like, um, um, uh, of, of whether how whether it can meet meet your needs. Um, also, imagine that um, as we uh, as Falcon gets rolling, um, we can likely do a bunch of the archiving for for the larger amounts of data um, and test it out kind of as a pilot 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 use case. Uh, one of the key things there is like really making sure that all the encryption stuff works extremely well because once once it starts going into kind of the the Falcon setting where um, there's miners all over the world, and you know you don't really know. Uh, many times, you as a client, you don't really know who they are and, and whatnot. Um, all of the all of the encryption use cases need to be like really, really, um, really solid. So yeah, look look forward to that use case. This is this is fantastic. Thank you so much for for pre presenting us. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for your support, Juan. Yeah, I think for this like a uh, uh, very specific discussions, I will talk talk with uh, with Protocol Labs. Uh, uh, we are already in talking with a few of you guys. Um, I think that I have some very specific ideas about around those topics. Uh, that's that's should be a very good you know discussion. Yeah, and for the for the shareable storage, I would recommend uh, definitely talking to to Textile, Three Box, and others who are working on the the kind of the threads. I think is a perfect use case for this. Um, there's a presentation um, today around uh, how to how to use threads and and hubs uh, around. Uh, think of like creating the social use case where you where you have a number of different data pieces like the video, the the comments, the the sharing, and so on, and making sure that all of that is kind of encrypted, um, uh, so that you know all of this is only shared with the parties that you wanna you wanna share this with, um, and all of those data structures can move around through uh, through mm -hmm. uh, We'll connect you to to all the folks, and, and I think for for everyone attending, um, uh, I think like the the speaker bios and so on can you can reach out to to speakers. Okay, very cool. Thank you. Thank you. And I do see like uh, because IPF has become like a very open storage system, it poses new challenges to like cryptography as well, right? Because before that, we have two layers for uh, protection. One is from the you know, system layer, basically any uh, uh, you know, authorized people can access the file and then encryption layer. For now, this, this layer, first layer is gone. Basically, we only have encryption as a, any one layer for protecting the data. So how can we do that? I think that's a challenge also to the crypto research. But that's, that's a very interesting, like uh, I would be very, very happy to see uh, the pattern shift like uh, IPFS and Filecoin is bringing to the, to the community. Very excited. Yeah. yeah, I think the closest thing that, that I've seen along those lines, um, Pinata, I think Matt, Matt Ober has written a lot of good, good articles about um, kind of private or 
I'm not quite sure what he called them because they weren't full private networks on IPFS, but they were kind of sub sub networks or topic based networks where you have um, you're not using the public IPFS DHT, but you're using um, a, a private DHT for a topic, but you publish the private the private key so that other people interested in that topic can join. Okay. Um, if you do would really want a like um, a swarm that only has kind of permissioned folks, um, like that that's an interesting place to explore. And I can imagine that's the sort of sort of service that I haven't seen popping up yet in the IPFS network of like um, either permissioned gateways or um, kind of infra around private swarms for very sensitive use cases. But that's the sort of thing that I could see happening more and more um, that might support, you know, very sensitive uh, things like, I don't know, private video. Yeah. Cool. And I think your, your earlier question of, should I run my own infrastructure? Should I use a pinning service? Or, or maybe you had one other option there. I think it really depends on um, kind of the tooling that you can get, like whether whether you can kind of do a division of responsibilities and then get more time back to focus on the next set of tools and applications you want to build, um, or if you want you know kind of the hands-on customization of of tweaking and optimizing things yourself. Um, I bet there's a lot of people on this call who would love to talk to you. So hopefully they'll be sending lots of emails uh, to your email, um, specifically about storing terabytes worth of uh, security cam footage. Yeah, thanks for everyone. We are definitely very open to work with you guys. Uh, we are small, so we want to focus on the things like we want to focus on, um, but we definitely like we need your help on the story side.